everyone and welcome back to the featured private practice segment on the private practice growth club youtube channel i'm so happy to welcome my guest today who is francis slubber from francis slubber and associates and this year 2021 they are celebrating 30 years of hearing healthcare. So 30 years in the industry. That is a long time. And in private practice, no less. So it is so amazing to have somebody with such a long track record in the private practice industry. And particularly the audiology industry, because I know there's a lot of changes that are happening in the industry as a whole. And that is why um, Francis also founded the Audiology Private Practice Forum. Um, but I'm not going to get into too much detail about what all those things are about. I'm going to let Frances introduce herself. So welcome, Frances, and thank you so much for joining me. Thanks, Tasneem, and thanks for having me. Um, it's quite exciting. I think this has been coming for a long time that you and I get together like this. Um, so you've said it. My name is Frances. A um, little bit of history. Um, so the practice I work at used to be called way back in the day, it was called the Hearing Clinic. And I joined in 1999. And at that stage, new laws came into play that said that you were, you had to name your practice by your own name. So um, a couple of years later, when I bought in as a partner, um, we named it Francis Slubber, Janet Steen Associates. And then Janet eventually retired. Janet was an acoustician, a hearing aid acoustician. And we ran a very happy partnership. Um, and the secret was that we had Janet's husband, who was an ENT, myself as an audiologist, and her as a hearing aid acoustician. And really, I think in the, in the world of audiology, it was the dream team. It was everybody under the same roof. Um, Jan was my mentor, so when she eventually, um, so I bought in and then bit by bit bought her out, um, and then she retired, and I've been, I, I say on my own since, but I've definitely nowhere near been on my own, I've got a fantastic team of people. Um, we are now, finally, five audiologists, and I have a team of five admin staff, and then of course your informal people who do cleaning, which I always mention because I don't think we can actually survive without them. Mm. Especially today in 2020, yeah. 2021. <laughs> yeah. You know, with the amount of spraying that's going on nowadays, um, yeah, I've got people walking around permanently with bottles of sanitizer. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so over the years we've grown, um, the practice itself, which is not what I want to talk about, but the practice itself had gone from a tiny little one-man team. It was just Janet. And then she was employing audiologists. And because the, the, the it worked, the relationship between ENT audiologist and acoustician worked so well. Um, I eventually was employed. It was my first audiology job. And, um, you know, and then it grew and we extended the practice and we bought another practice and we went from one branch to four branches in one year and it was all very exciting and then we had to start employing additional audiologists and it's just been a it's been a really nice um, learning curve um, learning how to grow when growth happens quickly learning how to slow down when growth isn't happening um, learning how to adapt um, you know when you're just a small little practice, um, you've seen two or three patients a day, very little paperwork is necessary. But once you get to a point where there's five audiologists and four sites, you actually, you need systems in place, you need things to work. And um, that led me to, well, it's it now nine years ago, um, develop a private, like a practice management program specifically for an audiology practice because I couldn't find anything in South Africa that that worked. Oh. Um, me and one of my audiologists, Celeste, went over to the States, learned about private or practice management tools, came back, wrote a, a program and got you know people to, pro, to write it for us, cloud-based and all of that. Oh, yeah. So over the years, I've really learned the value of effective systems. Um, we have, for example, we have workflows within the practice. So um, literally a paper map 
on the steps to follow. Mm. So what happens if a hearing aid comes in for repair? What happens if a patient is a new patient is booked? What happens if an old patient is booked? What are the questions that have to be asked on the phone? We have roadmaps and that's all taken years to develop, but it certainly had taught me um, the value of support, of not trying to, you know, climb the mountain on your own. Mm. And the value of um, having partners, having people who do what they do well and letting them do what they do well. Mm. Um, you know the classic saying that you don't get a plumber to do your accounting. And <laughs> um, I've, we've learned that. Don't get an audiologist to do your books. Um, you know, get an HR consultant because they know what they're doing. Yeah. Get bookkeepers to do bookkeeping. Um, and I own a few of the properties that my practices are in. So I do get plumbers quite regularly to do plumbing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm glad you're mentioning all of these things because in the Private Practice Growth Club, when I talk about practice management, I always say to people, I'm not talking about the software because that's what people tend to think about. Yeah. Um, and in the business world, what you're talking about is called your SOPs. That's right. And I don't think people really um, uh, understand what, what a critical role it is. And it, it doesn't have to be fancy. If you are a one-man band, it's just a ma matter of the first time you do something, document the steps that you took. Then Absolutely. review it and see what didn't work, change it, and then see until you find the recipe that kind of works. That's and right. I think that a lot of people struggle with when they scale is letting go of the reins. I know that is something I struggle with because I like to do everything myself. And part of the reason is because you think the next person's not going to do it correctly or the way you would do it. But there's a simple solution to that. If you give them the recipe of how you would do it, then they would do it the way you do it. Well, and, and they, they often they improve. improve. They often hmm. improve on the recipe. You yes, know? Yeah. 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 But before we go into all of that, I want to take a step back a little bit. And I think it would be important to maybe give um, a, just a broad overview about what is the difference. So I know you can study speech therapy and audiology and some people are dual registered. Um, so I think a lot of other health professionals like OTs, physios, don't really understand what the difference is and I I know it was it called logopedics or is it still called that so maybe if you could just give an overview of what audio and where audiology fits in and uh, into um, the you know into the system look it all depends on where you study so I studied in Pretoria and in Pretoria it's called um, B communication pathology okay. at I think Stellenbosch it's still called logopedics. I think at UCT they split. Um, so it really just depends on where you study. In Stellenbosch, for example, it forms part of the BSc course. In Pretoria at Tux, it's a course on its own. So it's not under BA or BSc. It's it's okay. B communication pathology. Um, things have changed. So you, you're asking a very old audiologist now <laughs> what currently <laughs> is happening. But when, back in the day, so I qualified in 97, I qualified as duly registered. So we studied as speech therapist and as audiologist. So we, we had both courses, we did both everything and, and all that. And then you, in your fourth year, you do an honors degree at the same time. So you do your thesis and then you choose one or the other, but it doesn't define what you end up doing after. Okay. I happened to do a year of speech therapy after, and I absolutely hated it. I knew this is not the way. Um, and I had done my thesis on um, cochlear implants. So um, I was always an audiologist, but at my time, we, we were duly registered. So we basically qualified. We were then registered under SLA, so speech language therapists and audiologists. Um, but I then deregistered because if, you, if you're duly registered, you have to get your CPD points for both wow. registrations. Mm. Um, and, you know, I was never going to do speech therapy again. So personally, and a few of my other colleagues did the same thing. Those of us who qualified back then. 
we would choose one, deregister as one, and re-register as the other. So I deregistered as an SLA and re-registered as an AU, which is audiology. Um, but as I say, depending on where you study, you can pick. So some, some universities will do two years joint and then you choose, or they'll do one year joint and then you choose. Um, and I think there are courses now where you don't join at all. Um, most of them, I think, do a year and then they split and mm. you qualify as one or the other. What, what do you think the benefits were of actually choosing to focus on one thing rather than trying to do both? There, there are many practices that are running very successfully as, as duly registered and they offer both services. Um, and I think if you are a one-man team, it is just a way of earning a more stable income out of services rendered rather than products. So, mm. um, you know, audiology is... Uh, it's, it, currently, it's a highly volatile um, profession to be in, and it's heavily reliant on the purchasing and selling of product, whereas speech therapy is maybe more consistent and more stable. Um, hmm. So a lot of us, those of us who are still duly registered, and I think Pretoria still allows dual registration, so dual qualifications, um, will maintain that simply because of the stability of income. Mm. So they may do their audiology practices in the morning, maybe do neonatal screening, that sort of thing. And then afternoons, of course, you're seeing your kiddies after school um, and you do language and all that. Um, some people would have chosen to go into adult neuro and adult neuro in speech therapy ties closely with aging and hearing aids. So there's a lot of um, mutual ground. Personally, I am not a pediatric audiologist at all. So talking about niching, I had gone into adults and the aged. That's what I do, that's what I love, that's what I specialize in. Yeah. Um, and having more than one audiologist in the team means that each of us could actually niche on something else. Yeah. So we have an audiologist who does all the vestibular work and I have one who focuses on the tinnitus and the um, rehab sort of stuff and we've got one who has particular interest in industrial audiology so you know it, it gives us that flexibility but ultimately my practice is is an adult practice that we hmm. refer peds out um, okay. however I think two of the five of us only were duly registered and had deregistered. And it gives us quite a bit of insight. You know, your, your speech therapy training, um, when we qualified, was the, the course training was very much more focused on speech therapy than it was on audiology. And only later years, which is why they split, the two courses were separated because audiology needed more time and more intense training. Mm. But we do have... Um, we do have quite a unique viewpoint because we have that background. Yeah. Um, however, as I say, there are lots of practices that very, that very successfully work as duly registered. And um, again, days gone by, one of the prerequisites in order for an audiologist to employ a speech therapist was that they would be duly registered themselves. Okay. I think that has changed since. Yeah. So now an, audio, an audiologist can employ a speech therapist without being herself registered okay. as a speech therapist, unless, of course, you have a group practice number and you then have to have the same, um, what? Same what profession. Like, professional <laughs> tag, if you will. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, there's lots of practices that would have, as the employer, either an SLA, so speech language audiologist or an audiologist, and they can employ audiologists and speech therapists. It's particularly useful in practices that do cochlear implants yeah. because they would have to have speech therapy and oral rehabilitation at the same time. And there's, it's two different fields. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think there are many practices that can. And I think if I had been um, very young and very new to practice, it would have been a useful way of just sustaining a healthy income, mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah. because you would see so many kids in an afternoon and so forth. It's just, it's stability. Um, as with, I would imagine OTs and physios, you have regular bookings. So I would see this kid for stuttering and I would book them every day 
or every week for the foreseeable yeah. future. So it's quite a stable, predictable income, whereas um, audiology is not at all. Um, you test, uh, you fit. If you go into oral rehab, there might be a few uh, bookings in advance, but it, it doesn't work that way. You know, it's much more, um, it's very seasonal. It's it's much more erratic. You have more, um, you know, good months and really bad months and that sort of thing. So your yeah. financial management has to really be up to scratch in audiology, whereas I think in speech therapy, you can wing it more easily. Yeah. So you have managed to be in this in the private practice um, for 30 years and you've spoken now about some of the challenges. So what would you say has been your biggest learning um, that you would for you know up and coming new audiologists who are starting private practices? What would be your biggest golden nugget that Oof. you would want to share with them? That's a loaded <laughs> question. Um, <laughs> private practice is hard. It's hard and it's even harder to do it right. Um, when we come to talking about APPF or Audiology Private Practice Forum, I'll yes. talk about that. But I think my, my nugget would be there are lots of temptations, money being the biggest one of them. Don't be swayed by money. Remind yourself why you did this in the first place. We all start off wanting to help people. And if you keep that in mind the whole time, so you just want to help, then it will come. Don't stress, it will come. But don't bend the rules. Don't exploit. Um, don't try and make the cuts. Because the moment you start losing focus, the moment you start losing sight of why you're here, you, you know all about finding the why. Then... Yeah then the lines blur and it becomes not only hard because it's always going to be hard and it was always going to be hard, but it becomes ugly mm. um, and it becomes nasty. And in a female driven profession, nasty is, is like nasty teenage girls, you know, it gets really nasty. Mm. So um, don't forget why, because ultimately everything else will follow. Do it right. Do it ethically do it morally um, and do it for the reason why you came in. Nobody studies audiology for the money. Oh. If that's what you think you're doing, then change careers now <laughs> because <laughs> nobody goes into speech therapy and audiology and physiotherapy and OT for the money. Yeah. Then go and do medical or accounting or something. But remember that at some point in your life, you knew that. Yeah. Um, and that the smell of money is doesn't actually throw you. Um, mm. And then secondly, reinvest, reinvest, reinvest. If you make a little extra, reinvest, buy better equipment, pay your people fairly, um, do not pay commissions ever, and re just reinvest, build your baby, um, because that's what you're raising. You're raising a child and you don't leave that child to dress themselves. You have to raise that child and reinvest, reinvest, reinvest. Yeah. So if there's a little extra, um, maybe don't go to Mauritius. Maybe buy a new machine. <laughs> <laughs> so I suppose you kind of already have touched on, you mentioned your, um, your SOPs, your recipes or your roadmaps and you mentioned reinvesting. Uh, so... You've kind of already answered my next question, but I was just going to ask, what would you say has been the thing that's most contributed to you being able to stay in practice for this long and then, um, you know, successfully so? Oh, that's easy. That would be the team by any margin. There's no way I could have done this on my own. So, um, like I said, I joined an existing practice. It had been around for eight years it wasn't successful. So when I joined, they had made no money in eight years. But realistically, no practice makes money in the first few years. So yeah. it, you know, I joined and then we started building and building and building. But through it all, I had a mentor, which is very important. I had um, administrative staff. So I had people that I could ask. I had colleagues that I asked a lot from. Um, 
So, and then eventually I had audiologists that I brought in and instead of treating them like, like staff, I treated them like equals. We've got the same qualifications. We know the same stuff. The only difference is experience. And I really drew on that. And in my practice, particularly, it might not work for every practice, but in mine, my audiologists are part of my management team. They are given administrative tasks. They each have an administrative portfolio. Um, so I don't do any of my own marketing, for example. I have an audiologist who does it, who populates everything for us. She writes the blogs. Um, I have um, another audiologist who's been appointed operations manager, so she has to keep her finger on the pulse. Um, I've got someone assigned to do internal training, staff training, events, that sort of thing. So everybody has an administrative function. Yeah. And I think one of the main reasons why that doesn't happen in practice is because of the threat. Because what if I teach <laughs> them, I'm yeah. teaching them how to do what I do. Yeah. And they can go do it somewhere else. But I think I'm one of the practices with the longest staff turnovers. I've got people who, um, my, my accounts person, Karen, is my right hand. She's been with me for 17 years. Um, wow. Alicia is the longest standing audiologist. She's been there for 13 years. Um, the newest audiologist has been there for almost six. So, yeah. you know, if you give them... Uh, if you involve them, if you give them a sense of ownership, and if we don't judge each other on our sales, but rather on our love for what we're doing, mm. um, everyone's happy. They're happy to be yeah. there. It's that yes, same, it has um, happened. It's you know, that same, yes. same teamwork makes the dream work. Yeah. And yes, <laughs> it has happened. I've had that girl who took the database and opened up next door. I, you know, I've had that. But mm. it didn't work. Because what makes mm. my team work is my team. And, yes. and I, I think they understand that. And they understand that if they pull out of that team and they go and try and do it on them, they can't recreate it because mm. they don't have the team. Well, it's, it's, a, it's that thing where they say, don't compare your day one to somebody else's day 100. And it's yeah. that case of when somebody um, goes and starts up, isn't it? They, all by all means, they are... You, that they like to do that, but they are starting day one. They they skipping all those years that you build up to the point where you are. So they can never actually replicate exactly what they left. Yeah, because yeah. they don't have those years of build up. Yeah, maybe eventually they'll get there. But yeah. um, but also what I love about what you're saying and why I'm glad you brought that up is because and this is a topic that I get really like ranty about. <laughs> I'm actually wearing a T-shirt that says "Collaboration over Competition." <laughs> yep, <laughs> because hundred percent. It's something that I am so passionate about. Where it really gets under my skin, and I think that what you have just described there, the problem that I'm noticing about among health professionals in private practice is that they don't really think of the they they know they're running a business, but if they really the structure of their practice to an actual like another business not in the health they will see they're not really running a business they're running a single solo practice with other additional people underneath whereas in an actual business where there's a, a company there's a and offices mm -hmm. that's exactly it you know yeah. it's not that you employ a health professional and then they just do like clinical work and that's it no because they are if they are part of your team then they in, 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 I mean, yeah. I work at a school, but I'm doing enrollments and playground duty and like, you know, that's not my job as an OT, but that's, I'm part of the team. So I have to tag along and do the that's thing that right. needs to be done. That's right. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, I mean, I have in my practice an, a formal management structure. There's a, a flow chart. There's a thing that shows who's at the top, who's next, who's next, and what your duties are. There's formal job descriptions, which they can access at any time online. So um, I think what's so hard about medical profession is that we're not trained in corporate law mm. at all or corporate uh, governance. We don't, we have no idea. My husband works in corporate and in corporate and oftentimes I'll come home and have a whole big bitching session and you go just fire them you know, it doesn't work like that we don't 
<laughs> it's not corporate, but it's not not. It's somewhere yeah. in between. And the more we start understanding that we can't run as a little person trying to employ this one to do that and this one to do that, and that one is not allowed to know what I'm doing. Number one, yeah. you're doing the profession a massive disservice. I feel that as the seniors around, it is our duty to change, to train the young people, even if it means they go open yeah. up next door at some point. Yeah. I will always be 20 years ahead of you. So yeah. do that if that's if that pleases you. But yeah. I will I'm responsible for what that person brings to the market. Yeah. And if they do go on their own and they do stupid things. It's because I taught them to do stupid things in the first place. Right. So right. if I teach them right, then I know that I've let them go and they will be and behave responsibly out in the big world. Right. Um, and then for the rest, it's up to them to make it work, to put in the hours and the effort and the, you know, I sit up with my laptop every night at midnight. You don't not work because you're not at work. Yeah. So, yeah, that the by far the secret to our success is the team. You know, when things go are hard, we've had tough times, we've lost um, family members, we've lost, you know, things have been tough. We've lost um, members of the team that have gone, that have retired, that have left, that have stolen, that have, you know, this stuff happens. And I've mm -hmm. learned the hard way to rely uh, to get an HR consultant in. Um, I make sure now that there's an open line of communication and that it's not necessarily with me because as mm. the boss, yeah. you, you're not actually everybody's friend and you're yeah. not supposed to be. Yeah. And people won't tell you the stories and they won't, they, they won't tell you their truths. You've actually got to have someone to do that. And um, you need to be okay with that as the boss yeah. because yeah. I think there's also this um, sense of like control that people yeah. can't, can't let go of control. That's right. That's right. So, yeah, I feel very strongly that we are um, responsible for our, our young people. And if they choose to go into private practice on their own, if they choose to stay, good, great. You know, if they choose to um, go and work in a, in a different industry altogether, I do feel responsible at some point. Um mm -hmm. I mean, I, as an example, many, many, many yonks ago, I had, um, I was getting married and it was time for us to employ our first audiologist, so second audiologist. Um, and I really thought I'm going to take this girl under my wing. I'm too young anyway at this stage to take anybody under my wing, but this is what I'm going to do. And I, I got close and then... Um, she decided to leave audiology and I, I was personally gutted because I thought, <laughs> you know, um, so much potential and such a wonderful audiologist and she's gone into medical repping and, um, <laughs> you know, and you feel personally responsible because you think, well, did I not sit, did I not make this job fun enough? Mm. But at the end of the day, it's each to his own. But had she chosen to go into private practice on her own, I would be personally responsible for her behavior out yeah. in the world. Yeah. Um, so I do think that it's our it's our duty to train the young people to not hide the facts from them. You know, oh, do, you can't see the price list. And oh, no, you're not yeah. allowed to say this. And, <laughs> yeah. and you can't see my figures. Yeah. And, you know, I play very open cards. I tell the girls when, when we're doing well. Um, uh, we have weekly sit-down meetings. I tell them when we're not doing well. Um, it it really is important that they know and understand that private practice is a roller coaster ride. You have ups, you have downs, you have very scary moments. Last year was a prime example, but we've had a few of hmm. them. And <laughs> and if I'm not communicating that to them when they're ready to go out, they will have this rosy colored little picture of how easy it's going to be because yeah. that's what Francis made it look like. And it really isn't. Yes, yeah. No, no, it's not. I mean, competition is actually meant to, um, you know, the competition commission, uh, the whole thing about anti-competitiveness is that competition is good because it forces you to up your game, to constantly yeah. improve yourself. And I think the misconception is that competition is about 
the other person and preventing mm-hmm. the other person. It's not. Competition, being a great competitor, so I mean, if you take, like, say you were running a race. Running a race, if you're running a race, it's not about putting barriers in front of the other person so that they don't get to the finish line. Any athlete will tell you their mental focus is on themselves. How do they improve themselves? Yes, they're going to look at what the competition is doing, the training methods and see, okay, but they're not going to copy that. They're going to look, well, how can I improve on that? How can I do that better? And yeah. the focus, when you focus on yourself and what you're doing and stay in your lane, then this whole thing about the nastiness and territorialism and all of that won't happen. Yeah. But I think what we're discussing now is really a good entryway into the next topic that I want to talk about. You mentioned already in the beginning, there's a lot of changes that's been happening in the audiology industry. And so I would like to talk about the, uh, the Audiology Private Practice Forum how that came about, why it came about, what it's about. Because I think this is a fantastic resource for those audiologists who actually want to come into private practice. And it's doing exactly what you're saying, you know, taking the responsibility as somebody who is a senior in your industry to kind of really take the younger ones under your wing and give them the support that you perhaps didn't have when you were starting out. You know, over the last few years, internationally, the landscape for audiology has changed radically. Um, and the scariest part was in America when a bill was signed to allow over-the-counter sales of hearing aids. So, um, you know, the, these things start slowly, but it, pretty much it's a matter of unmedicaling hearing aids. So in the States, there are certain, in, in some of the States where you can just buy over-the-counter hearing aids, most of the States are unbundling costs so you pay for the hearing aid and then you pay for services which leads to price wars and online things and so forth now south africa being a much smaller um industry we're watching this and we're seeing it happen and over the years the game has become harder and harder so we are for example um a couple of years ago, they instituted NAPI codes. So now you've got to go through a process of registering hearing aids on NAPI codes. What they're trying to do is it's not about the NAPI code in, as such, which is a descriptive code, but it is a figure. So it's a price tag that is um, aligned with a particular hearing aid. Now, there's pros and cons to this. On the one hand, you're regulating the market. So you are getting rid of people who are overcharging for product. At the other hand, you're dealing with private practice, which all have different overheads. So I have a big chain. I've, I've got four practices. I have um, my, my overheads would be completely different to the audiologist running her practice from home. So you know, we are meant to adjust our tariffs and our fees based on that. But our medical aid fee, so the rate that we get from the medical aid, is massively undervalued. Um, so we have to make up for it in the hearing aid sales. But if you're starting to regulate that, not only are you encouraging um, – companies and and people getting together and setting prices so non-competitive behavior um Mm. you're also trying to control choice so you're trying to withdraw take away choice from patients um you're trying to force them to in a in a diff in a direction of a particular brand or a particular model and that sort of thing mm. and it started slowly and as the nhi talks are coming in it's growing more and more and more and more so on the one hand we have this threat that independent private practice um, as we know it where i'm an autonomous audiologist i have no deals with anybody i can fit a b and c i um personally set my price so my markups are set exactly the same for each company so there's no financial draw to do Mm. one or the other it is all about what is best for the patient Mm. however 
Um, because it's so hard being in private practice, for years there's been weird things happening, like a uh, company A will come and give you 100,000 Rand to start up your practice, but in exchange you've got to sell only their products. Right. So um, the Health Professions Council and the Medicines Act have all tried to curb down on these things, but it creates, you know, you you get rid of this thing, but it creates grounds for something else to start growing right. in the dark. Yeah. And currently, um, our biggest threat is online models. So hearing aids being sold online under the... Um, so in South Africa, it's still a medical device. So you can't just sell it online. You have to have a audiologist somewhere or a hearing aid acoustician endorsing this and making it possible. Okay. Um, then there are um, what they call, it's not, they're not referring to themselves as a third party, but effectively that's what it is. Um, so you have a company A, make a deal with company B and get the audiologist to sign in for lower rates, but they will find the patients for you. So you don't have to spend on marketing, et cetera, but you, but you cut down on your income in exchange. So, right. uh, you know, so it, it just leaves a lot of gray area. Um, and then of course, so it's we, kind of like the models that they have, like within the mental health profession in the, in the States, where a lot of counselors can contract in to these like commercial services where they basically give you patients, but, a lot of therapists over there complain that, you know, they're not making enough to make ends meet. They're very That's right. busy. They because a third, exactly. Because there's a third party taking a cut of the pie. Right. And as it is, that pie is very small in South Africa. You right. know, there are only around 300 private practice audiologists. It's a tiny pie. Um, right. And if you think socioeconomics, the, the, Social economic group, <laughs> this magic door at the back again. <laughs> the, the, the social economic groups that would benefit from private practices is quite small. Yeah. You know, we're not, we're not looking after the 70 million of the population. We're looking after a very yeah. small cut of that because that's only who can afford private practice services. Yeah. Um, so, the moment you add a third party to the to the story, there is going to be losses somewhere. Mm -hmm. It will never be the supplier ever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also because the supplier is not um, regulated by the health professions council. Exactly. So they, they can, can they can use whatever business models will ensure yep. that they are profitable and yep. the little audiologist here on the side is stuck yep. because they're not supposed to take commissions, they're not That's supposed right. to take That's centers, right. all of these things, yeah. So, you know, ultimately, we, we need to somehow ensure that independent private practice stays alive um, and stays ethical. So... Between all of these models, for example, you'll have franchising. You'll have one guy open 34 shops in the country. They have massive staff turnovers because they, their audiologists are young, they're inexperienced, they get paid well, um, but there's no mentoring, there's no guidance. They just get plonked down in a shop. They sell as many hearing aids as they possibly can in order to make their quotas. Um, they work on commissions, you know, and then eventually they just leave because it's horribly unrewarding. Mm. Um, but, all, but, but the model exists and it's very successful. Um, so bit by bit over the last few years, um, you know, we've seen these things happen. We've seen these little things pop up and we've seen how inadequately the HPCSA is handling it. Um, mm. You can complain until you're blue in the face. If they've got a good rebuttal or a good lawyer, they get a little slap on the wrist, 5,000 Rand um, fine and, and, and then business as usual. Um, so, you know, bit by bit by bit, I have become increasingly irritated um, with the state of affairs. I've got colleagues who have been um, 
cons in the same situation. They're getting irritated with the lack of, of action that's being taken. And um, the last straw was mid last year when we had one of these online models um, aggressively approach audiologists and they, in the midst of lockdown and COVID, literally in the middle of lockdown and panic and am I going to have a practice and will we survive this and am I going to be around in a month's time and I've got bills to pay and you know, in the middle of that panic, this star in the west comes down and says oh we'll send you patients all you need to do is sign here mm. and you sign your life away mm. and um so that was that was the last straw and i contacted a few colleagues and we called together a concept group and we brainstormed how do we approach these things how do we as independent practitioners actually say no mm. um just no. How do we support each other? Um, and then APPF, the concept was born. So, um, yeah, the, you know, the, the concept group was formed. We started brainstorming and, um, and then we formed the Audiology Private Practice Forum. So initially, the idea was just a get together, a matter of let's call some senior audiologists together. Let's try and get practices to to think this through. How do we stop this from happening? How do we stop um, ourselves being bullied by the big players? Um, and then it evolved. And then we, be, we decided, okay, the only that way this really can work is if APPF took on more than just um, the role of, you know, the girl with the flame. Yeah. APPF has to actually do and the one marketing, so the, the selling point of these models is you don't have to do anything. We'll find you the patients, particularly online. Mm. And my feeling was, well, if you're not online, why not? If you're mm. not finding your own patients online, why not? Mm. Why are you sitting back going, well, they'll send me the online patient. Find your own online patients. Mm. So where APPF was born was get audiologists, independent audiologists to pool resources and get themselves online, get them to build websites, get them to have Facebook profiles, Instagrams, LinkedIn profiles, etc. Be online because you can't be found otherwise mm. anyway. Build your brand. You know, there's, there are rebranding models out there, but why would you rebrand when you are your brand? We know that in and in the allied profession, you are your name. Your practice mm. is you. Yeah. It is not ABC OT. It is yeah. not um, Knees for All. It is Tasneem Abrams and it is Francis Slubber. And that is the name that draws people in. That is your, that's your street tag. It's yeah. not something else. And so APPF is all about marketing the brand um, of its members. So the idea is get the members, get audiologists and private practice to join, and then we market their brand online. We help them do their websites. We help them, um, not physically, I don't go and build a website. I put you in contact with a website <laughs> builder because I'm not mm. a website builder. That's mm. what they do. Yeah. Like I said, I'm not a plumber. You get that person. Mm. So we put you in contact with the people who can build it. We can put you in contact with coaches. We put you in contact with bureaus, um, with financing houses. We, we allow you easy access to those who know better. And mm. you do what you do, which is audiology. Yeah. Um, but build your own brand. That's what you've worked for. You didn't go and start your own practice in order to be called someone else. Yeah. Um, so it's so funny that you bring that up because I'm I'm going to be doing a, um, a CPD talk for physios um, around marketing and mind or mindset. Um, and it's this is something the whole name in your practice has come up a lot, and the all loopholes around. And I'm all for if you want to have like a, a brand as well, but like this is something that I actually mentioned mentioned in my talk that I'm preparing around even if you are a shy person and you don't want to be front and center your your brand that you're hiding behind still needs to be in your voice 
And so yes. the blogs that you write and things, you still need to introduce your name into the content you create. Even if you don't want your face to be on there, that's completely understandable. If you're a complete shy introvert, you can still not show your face and not be on camera and create content that has your name attached to it because yeah. you are your personal brand and the health professions council, the, the rules around social media and that it is more around your, your role as a person. And most of the social media guidelines, in fact, in booklet 16 is not about marketing or practice. It's about even your use of, of social media and your private capacity because you are held to a higher level of ethics That's right. because you are a health professional. And so it just makes sense that you leverage off that. And in fact, growing a personal brand is so much easier than growing a, um, a inanimate brand because people buy from people, not brands. Exactly. And, and, and in fact, one of the research that I found that the, uh, was that 90% of people will rather buy from people that they trust, even if they don't know that personal person personally, than they would from a recommendation of a brand. Yes. 90%. Yes. That's incredible. Yep. You know, there's a there's an online culture and I'm very I'm very guilty of it. I do everything online. I buy everything online. <laughs> but when it comes to big things, when it comes to big decisions, I want guidance. I want to know that I'm doing the right thing. Yeah. And and I find personally I find it incredibly scary that people would be willing to blindly buy 70,000 rands worth of hearing aids mm. from a non-face, yeah. you know, and, and my immediate response would be, but what if, what, what if, what if it breaks, what if this, what if that, and those of us in the profession know that those what ifs happen all the time, mm. Mm. but as a person with a name, you are welcome to come and sit down and talk to me and I will make a plan. I will bend over backwards. Yeah. But if I'm just an email on the other side, I mean, have you ever tried to get hold of take a lot? It's <laughs> it, just having a number assigned to your yeah. query. You lose all your identity and with medical conditions, you are not your issue. You are a person. Mm. You are not your hearing loss. And this is what's starting to happen is they say, oh, send us your audiogram. So go and have a little audiogram and then send us that and we'll send you a hearing aid. Mm. You are nothing other than an audiogram. Mm. But in professional practice, the audiogram is just one. It's just mm. step one. It's nothing in the bigger scheme of things. There's needs analysis. There's, re there's rapport. There's conversation. There's talking about your children, because if you have five-year-old grandchildren um, screaming at bath time while you're trying to bath them versus you have adult children who are at the house and you never see the kids, the yeah. choices are different and, and the applications are different. So personally, I find the online-ness um, of things, the, the disconnect that comes with that, Mm. most scary um, but then APPF was born because of the exploitation there's a lot wrong with the system but there's still a lot right with the system because there are still so many of us in independent practice and as long as we are here we have the power to join forces and yeah. if I if I could change anything it would be to get my professional colleagues to understand that I am not your threat mm. I am not your competition I am just another audiologist down the road your mm. competition is spec savers disc M, clicks pick and pay um, and all the other names yeah. that are trying to take away what you've worked for they're literally going to take away your practice it's not a stolen yeah, I mean, patient you, here or a just, stolen patient there yeah if we just look at what happened to the pharm pharmacy industry exactly i'm mean, just in my neighborhood uh, there was a little pharmacist that i used to go to because it was just opposite my company yeah. and i knew the owner she was the main pharmacist behind eventually she closed and then i had to go to clicks there was no other pharmacy and when i went to clicks she was actually working there it was oh, very sad. Yeah. and there's not you don't anymore get a lot of those little independent no, pharmacies no. anymore. We, and, and really, 
Audiology is going to go the same way if we don't learn from what we have seen. We've seen it in optometry. We've seen it in pharmaceuticals. We can see what's coming. And yeah. if we just act proactively, if we, yeah. if we see it coming, why are we just sitting around waiting for it to happen? Why aren't we taking action? Yeah. Now, um, I keep referring to audiologists taking action because – Many, many years ago in the 80s, um, we had our professional body called Sashla, speech, I have to think, speech, uh, South African Speech Language Hearing Association. And the audiologists that were part of this, so members of that organization who were fitting hearing aids and were in private practice in audiology felt that they were... Um, not represented anymore. Right. So they started an organization called Audiologist in Action. They had all the same, they had similar frustrations, just different models. So similar right. threats, but different models. Um, they started Audiologist in Action. Audiologist in Action later years became SAAA, so the South African Association for Audiology, of uh, audiologists, and it has gone from strength to strength. And over the years, obviously, it has grown, rightfully so. They incorporated audiologists from all walks of life, so whether they're government or education or whatever. So SAAA now is our representing body for audiologists, mainly who are just qualified as audiologists. Some that are still duly registered would still belong to the original SASHLA. Um, but they're an umbrella now. They're really looking out for the profession mm. and again audiologists and private practice are starting to feel frustrated so APPF was formed and right in the beginning we said let's not make the same mistakes let's not do what they had done which was we break from you mm. but rather we start and we collaborate with you so we are not going off on our own. We're not going to start a new society, not at all. We want the audiology society to be the audiology society. And yeah. therefore, they represent us as well. Yeah. Yeah. But APPF is specifically and very specifically for independent private practices um, at, at the the best will, looking after the best interests of those in, in independent private practice. So you can't, for example, join APPF as, a, as an option one member, which is a full member, if you own a franchise, um, because then you're no longer independent. If you have signed a single supply contract with one of the suppliers, you're no longer autonomous. Um, okay. So we are very specifically aiming at independent practices because we are all fighting the same the same monsters we are all in the same boat right. um and i think if i could accomplish anything it would just be to get them to pull together to to pull resources so one for marketing purposes i can do a hell of a lot more with a thousand rand from 10 people than i can do a thousand rand on my own i mean everybody who's ever been part of a stock fell knows that yeah um I can negotiate for better pricing. I can negotiate for better malpractice pricing. I can negotiate for better pricing on um, practice management systems, on financing systems, on ev everything. If I'm right. speaking for 10 people or 50 people one day, I, I have a lot more clout. Yeah. However, we will not be a buying group. So, the moment you're a buying group, you're compromising ethics again. The moment you have a third party negotiating um, rebates, you're no longer autonomous. Mm. Um, you're no longer independent because you're no longer making your own choices. Yeah. Someone's doing it for you. So APPF have um, gone round to a certain suppliers um, of hearing aids, suppliers of equipment, PPE suppliers, We've got you as one of our coaches, currently our only coach. Um, we've got finance houses. We've got banks. We've got um, 
Calabash courses. So we've got people doing CPD training. We have got um, practice management systems, a couple of those. So there are so many levels at which we have power if we pull together. And then ultimately, right. hopefully, when we get to enough members, we're now at 16. When we get round to having enough members and we have enough financial backing, we can get lawyers involved. We can fight these guys. We can, instead of going through HBCSA mm. infinitely, we could take them to the high court. We can yeah. actually, we'll have power. Yeah. Um, and as individual audiologists, we just don't, we just don't yeah. have that. Because I think also the problem is when you're dealing with people outside of the health professions, HPCSA always makes it clear that they, their primary mandate is to protect the public That's right. and to protect the reputation of the profession. Anything yep. that falls outside of the health profession is not their, not their baby. That's not yep. what, they, that what they are there for. They're yep. there to represent our, they, they are there to represent us, but ultimately it's not about us. They don't, it's not about protecting us, it's about protect, protecting our profession the and the public. That's uh, right. and which, which makes sense. I mean, it does make sense. But um, so uh, expecting them to kind of fight a corporate or some entity that is outside of that industry, um, they don't have the capacity. I mean, no. just the thing about the naming of practices where some people have been not naming them according to the rules. Uh, the ombudsman has said that we, they haven't had the capacity to go and regulate all those things. And they are trying to put in place systems where they actually go and check on all of these things that are people complying with the ethical rules. But it's not going to happen overnight. So if they can't even monitor us as a profession um, enough, like, you know, well enough, how are they going to now still fight people outside of our profession? That's so, right. Um, especially, especially considering that the lines are so blurred. You know, there's, there's ethical law. So there's HPCSA Ethics, and then there's Medicines Act, which is yeah. not the same thing. And there's Department of Health Laws. So there are so many blurry lines, and we don't always yeah. understand which goes where. Um, yeah. And thankfully, through my relationship with Expedient now, I've got someone to ask. So again, APPF has given me that, in that I can pick up the phone, speak to a lawyer, and go... Is this okay? Um, mm. According to the HPCSA, according to the Medicines Law um, and the, the Medicines Act, is this okay? You know, mm. and I think yeah. when we're on our own, we just feel helpless. We feel like there's nobody to ask. Um, mm. You phone a friend, but the friend goes, I don't know. I, yeah. You know, <laughs> um, but yeah. now I want to, I want to say that, APPF is meant to, to be that friend who has a little bit of, of clout um, mm -hmm. and they've got the right friends as friends, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, we are steadily building our, um, what we call our reward partner program, which is these people like yourself who are our go-to specialists, our go-to know-hows, our go-to plumbers, if you will. Um, <laughs> and... And to give practices, if you exclude product, so don't think product. If, if you look at my financials every month, a part of it is cost of sales. There's product that has to be bought. But take that out. There's a huge chunk. Half of it, more than half of it, is just overheads, is costs, is, is billing, is um, – switch fees and name it, it's salaries and renegotiating and workman's compensation. And, yeah. you know, there are other ways for us to maximize practice. We don't have to exploit the patient. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. actually just need to know how to do business and how to do it well in order for us to be more profitable. Um, yeah. And, and I think, yeah, I think APPF is all about just putting people in touch with each other. We share resources. We share um, workshops. You know, I stumble onto something. Someone else stumbles onto something and sends something across. I put down, I've got this audiogram today. I don't know what to do with it. Help. And I've got a, I've got a network of resource. I've got, yeah. I've got mentors um, who will not judge me 
but guide me and yeah. not feel like they don't want to divulge because I'm the next door competitor competitor because yeah. someone from KwaZulu Natal can actually then advise me and I'm not a threat yeah you know <laughs> yeah. so yeah. um yeah that that's the hope as I say APPF is young we officially launched on the 1st of January um we've been working very hard to to have a very active online presence wow. um I have made sure that we employ so um not administrative staff yet, we're not there, but we have a social media person. So we have a formal social media contract with someone who does this for a living. Um, we have a the lady who built the website is managing all of the membership issues and the administrative stuff behind that. Um, so that us as the directors of APPF, are still audiologists. We still just want to do our audiology. So right. we do that and we do yeah. that well. And we form the, the backbone of the audiological support to APPF members, but the system will run in the background. Oh. That is amazing. And I, I mean, I think it's very much aligned with what the Private Practice Growth Club is about. Um, of, of course, Private Practice Growth Club is all health professionals and that is why it made sense to collaborate. And it's the same thing. I mean, um, uh, in the OTs, uh, in stock, which is the uh, sort of the ABPF of occupational therapists, um, I mean, they also have similar programs to what I run. And it's also, I mean, I could have said, oh, well, you guys are copying me. <laughs> or, but that's not the case. We actually like in discussions of how we can collaborate and we'll see, okay, yeah. well, if you're already doing that, then I'm not going to like, reinvent the wheel let's see how we can join forces um and that's the same thing with i mean uh, it's it would on the on on the surface it would seem like okay well what you're doing and what private practice growth club is doing isn't it the same thing well no it's not because there's some something that i can't offer that you can offer and then where like you're saying where there's um expertise that you need further or where members need additional support that's where i can then offer that support for your members and it's Absolutely. just about all working together and, and providing people yeah. with the information yeah. and the support that they need. You know, I think one of the most valuable um, things about APPF is that it's a non-profit. So we're not here as audiologists Ooh. to run APPF as a business that makes money. The whole idea behind it is um, – aiding the member practices helping the member practices that's Mm. all it is and it's got a max spend attitude so whatever comes in 60 percent of that is spent on marketing the rest we pay their malpractice um, insurance for them and the management of websites and admin and pay fast fees and that sort of thing Um, and then hopefully eventually as I say, if as, as the membership grows, we'll be able to support our reward partners more. So I'll be able to say to people, if they phone me and say, look, I'm in trouble, um, APPF will say, well, you need a coach, phone Tasnim. Mm. You need a proper practice management system, phone this guy. You need this, phone that person. Um, you need a place to park your money, phone that guy. So... Um, mm. Yeah, the whole idea is getting all of the partners are medical industry specialists. And therefore, if I'm considered a specialist in something, I can support everybody else who needs that service Hmm. in a specialized manner. And like you, you are a specialist in in coaching and guiding and growing practices. I'm not. I can grow my own. That's as far as I can grow. Um, and I can't guide people accordingly. So really, APPF is all about the fact that we need to join forces and we need to join hands in order to have independent private practice survive. We're not going to survive if we don't pull together. Yeah. Um, I had a very sort of enlightening moment a couple of weeks ago when I was telling, um, I was telling my daughter, she's 11, And I was telling her about a particular patient we'd seen in the day and what a wonderful, rewarding experience it had been because it just went, everything went according to plan and it was just laughter and tears and all the good stuff. And she said, you know, mommy, do you think I will be able to be an audiologist one day? 
And I had this moment where I went, actually, I don't think we'll have a profession when you're grown up. You know, wow. and if, okay. if things go the way yeah. they're going, private practice will not exist when you are done studying audiology. You know, mm. that's, you're 11. So that's what, 15, 14 years down the line. I yeah. don't think private practice as we know it will exist. Mm. I'm all for change. I am, I'm, my staff call me a perpetual changer because I am drawn to, to change. I get very bored very quickly and things have to change. Um, so mm. someone like me, I, I'm not, I, I don't have a fear of change or adapting, but it has to be healthy and it has to be right, mm. and it has to serve the public. And what's happening yeah. in the industry now is none of that. It's yeah. not serving the public. We, we have got one after the other patients walk in where they've been done in, and they've literally been exploited and um, by these, these models that exist. And the only way we're going to ever get rid of it is if we stand up together and do it together, you know. Mm. Otherwise, yeah. honestly, there will not be a profession in, in 14 yeah. years' time when she wants to do it. That. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Really was. I kind of went, oh, sweetie, I think you must go into medical technology and go grow some stem cells or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, thank yeah. you so much. It was so incredible speaking to you. You have a wealth of knowledge and experience, obviously, and doing so much for the profession, which is always refreshing. Um, I think so far, everybody that I've had on as a featured practice has been somebody who's had that same kind of mindset of sharing. And um, like Hanika was the first guest. She's also the chair lady yeah. of InStop. And it's the same thing. She has the same desire and energy to help those coming up behind her with all her experience. And um, it's, it's, it's what we need really to stand together. So thank you so much for taking the time. Um, it's a pleasure. And, it was lovely. And to your family for giving up the sweet tablet. <laughs> We've had people <laughs> crawling behind me. <laughs> Everybody and wants then, to get to the cupboard with the bar ones in them. <laughs> okay. Okay. Oh, that's uh, yeah. So you were hugging the cupboard with the sweet <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tasneem. Lovely and to chat to 